symbolisms. Now, <clears throat> the last time we were together, I set the context of this parable for you. I showed you what it was about. It was, it was about the time where Jesus was in tremendous confrontation from Matthew chapter 21 all the way through Matthew chapter 23 where he had rode into Jerusalem on what we call the triumphal entry on Palm Sunday and he rode into town and he had this tremendous confrontation going on with the Pharisees all the way through. It was in this confrontation that he says, woe unto you scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. Woe unto you scribes and Pharisees, you make people twice the sons of hell that you are. Woe unto you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Woe unto you, you're a bunch of serpents, you're a, you're a generation of vipers, how will you escape the damnation of hell? And he, and, he, and he was in this time with them, and he said to them, this generation shall not pass until all these things, all the things of the tribulation will come upon you. He walks out of the temple, and as he walks out of the temple and walks to the Mount of Olives, the disciples come to him and says, Lord, look at all these things. He says, how can this be? And he says, can you tell us when it's going to happen? And he says, yeah. And he begins to tell them in all of Matthew chapter 24, he gives them the, the beginning of the sorrows, seven of them. He goes on through there. He talks about the great tribulation that was to come upon that generation. Not upon our generation, but the great tribulation that was to come upon that generation. And it's in this context that Jesus tells this parable. He comes to, to it and he tells the parable of the fig tree. He says, this generation shall not pass. All you've got to do is learn how to understand things. And he says, and when you see the budding of the fig tree, you'll know that it's about to come upon this generation, for it will not pass. He tells the parable about, about, the, about the, the, the thief in the night. He says, all you got to do is be smart. All you got to do is know that if, the thief, if you know when the thief is coming, you're not going to allow your home and your family to be destroyed. He tells the parable about the good and faithful servant that takes care of the things that the master has given him to oversee. He doesn't go out and get drunk just because the, the master is taking his time and coming back. Then he tells the parable of the ten virgins. Then he goes on, he tells the parable of the talents. He gave one five, one two, one one. Which one messed up? What did the other, what did the guy that had five do? What did he do? How, how did he come out? He made five more. What did the guy that had two do? He made two more. What did the guy that had one did? He buried it, didn't use it. And this is the context. He goes from there and he talks about the sheep and the goats. He says, he says in, this, in this parable of the sheep and the goats, he says, he says I'm going to take, take the goats, I'm going to put them on my left side, I'm going to take the sheep, put them on my right side. And he says, I'm going to tell you, come on into the kingdom of God, welcome you. But Lord, how, how are we welcome? What, what do we do? Well, when you visited the sick, when you visited those in prison, when you clothed the naked, and when you fed the hungry, you did it unto me because you did it unto the least of these my little ones. Hear me now. This parable is set in the midst of doing something in the kingdom of God. Taking what God has given you, your talents, and using them. Ministering to the naked. Ministering to the hungry. Ministering to people. Being a good and faithful servant. Being a person that loves people, that takes care of the people of God. Being a person that's wise and takes care of your family. Watching for the thief in the night. A person that is sharp and can discern the budding of a fig tree. This is what this parable is set in, in the midst of. It is set in the time of the destruction of A.D. 70. When Jerusalem fell to the Roman soldiers and it was laid desolate. The whole temple has never been rebuilt. Now does that mean, because it does have an historic implication, does that mean that it's nothing for me? Does it mean that there's nothing that I can gain from this particular parable? Absolutely not. Because he's talking about wise virgins and foolish virgins. And as long as there are wise people and foolish people, this parable is relevant. So to understand it, we've got to understand, first of all, context. Then we've got to understand customs. The customs of the time were something like this. Where, where today we have a wedding, the, the bride and I, uh, excuse me, the groom and I come out and we stand here. And, and we were, when all of his parties, who comes out now? The bridemaids comes out. And they come out and they're holding their bouquet. That bouquet means something. They're going out to meet him before the bride comes. That means something. What does that mean? 
It means that what the bride is bringing to the marriage is a freshness, is a, is a beauty, is a color, is all the things that are involved in a bouquet, is a fragrance. She's bringing something into the, into the wedding, into the marriage. Well, these, these in Bible times were giving a lamp, an oil lamp. And their job was to go and meet the groom with the lamp. Speaking of something, what would that speak of? She's bringing a light. She's bringing a glow. The book of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 7 says that the glory of the man is the woman. She's bringing a glory into his presence. She's going to make him look good. She's going to reflect him in everything that she does. My wife makes me look good. Somebody say something. Yeah. She not only looks good, but she makes me look good. And after the 33 years of being married to this woman, she has never one time made me look bad. She is my glory. And as, the, as, the, as these bridesmaids, as these ten virgins would come out, they would bring, they would bring the lamp. Speaking of her glory. The new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven. John says in the book of Revelation, chapter 21 and verse 9, Come, let me show you the Lamb's wife, the bride of the Lamb. And he took him on a, mount, on a hill, and he saw the new Jerusalem descending out of heaven with the glory of God. And he starts talking about the brightness of that new Jerusalem. Because the bride shows his glory. The church is to show the glory of Jesus. And as these came out to meet them, five were wise and five were foolish. Five were able to fulfill their purpose, and five did not. You'll notice number nine on your check sheet. If you were having to check today, if you're a wise virgin or a foolish virgin, which classification would you be in today? Are you bringing glory? Or is your lamp out? And this is what the parable is about. What are you doing in the kingdom? If you don't look at it in context, and if you don't look at it in, in, in manners and customs of Bible times, you're going to end up with a story and a parable that you just can't explain. For example, if you didn't understand what I just told you, why would the Lord want ten wives? And then why would he ask ten of them to marry him and then say to five of them, I don't know you? Why does the Lord begin this particular parable with, then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto? And in most parables he says, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto. If these were Christian ladies, why wouldn't they share their oil? You know why? Because you can't share your oil. It's your oil. So we have to look at manners and customs. We have to look at context. And then today I want to concentrate just a little bit on is we have to look at symbolisms. We have to look at symbolisms. Now, <clears throat> I want to look at three primary symbolisms in, in this parable. I want to look at the number 10. I want to look at the lamp or the light. And I want to look at the oil. By understanding these three symbolisms, you'll understand the parable, and you'll be able to apply this to your life. It just won't be a story that you don't understand or a story that meant something for somebody else, but you'll be able to take it and apply it to your life if we understand the three symbolisms. Now, let me tell you this, the importance of symbolisms. <clears throat> Using this example, Jesus was talking to his disciples in Matthew chapter 16. And in verse 6, he says, Take heed, beware of the leaven of of the Pharisees. Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Well, they didn't know what he was talking about because they didn't understand what leaven meant to the Lord. And they said, well, Lord, we picked up all these fragments. You know, we got all this extra food. And the Lord says, you, you don't know what, what I'm talking about. In Matthew chapter 13, and in the parable that he tells there, he says that the kingdom of God is likened unto leaven, yeast, that a woman takes and puts in a lump of dough and works it into that lump of dough until the whole lump becomes leavened. 
Now, when he tells them to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees, this is a negative aspect of leaven. But when he tells them that the kingdom of heaven is likened in two leaven that a woman takes and put in, puts into a leaven, that's a positive. Now, we don't know what he's talking about unless we understand what leaven is. We're totally lost in what Jesus is trying to teach us here. Reading on in Matthew chapter 16, they, the disciples, it, finally the light comes on after, after Jesus explains to them, and they finally understand that what the leaven really is talking about, what the Lord is really speaking about using leaven, is the doctrine. Beware of the doctrine, the teachings of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Because you see, the doctrine of the Pharisees and Sadducees was like serpent's venom. He called them, you generation of vipers, you snakes. What, the, what doctrine does to you, if it's false doctrine, if it's poisonous doctrine, it's like a snake biting you and it gets inside of you and it messes your whole life up. It, it begins to shut down your life. It begins to shut down your vital organs. And that's what doctrine, false doctrine will do to you in the, realm, in the realm of the kingdom of God. It begins to shut you down where you can't enjoy the things of the kingdom. But good doctrine, Doctrine that is leaven of the kingdom, when it works into you and it's woven into the whole lump of your life, everything about you becomes kingdom oriented. Your family becomes kingdom oriented. Your finances become kingdom oriented. Your health becomes kingdom oriented. You raise your children according to the kingdom. You work your job according to the kingdom. And everything you do begins to bring glory to God. 